How can you transmute the power of sex into the good and the beautiful? A crystal clear answer can be found by you if you search for it as you listen to and study this entire book. Results will be achieved when you relate and assimilate the principles into your own life. But one must gain knowledge for himself. The following suggestions may be helpful as you search for your answer while listening. 1. Keep your mind on the things you want and off the things you don't want. This means that you keep your mind on immediate, intermediate, and distant desirable objectives. The instinct of sex in the subconscious mind will be patient if it has hope that you will fulfill life's mission. The boy or girl who is truly in love and plans to marry will not have the sex problems he or she might otherwise have. 2. If there were more and often earlier marriages, there would be fewer sex problems. Life's mission to procreate is fulfilled in marriage. However, marry for love beyond the sex instinct. 3. Lead a well-balanced four-square life. 4. Work long hours at a labor of love. It will keep you busy, occupy your thoughts, and use up surplus energy. 5. Develop a magnificent obsession. Study the significance to be found in Chapter 15. 6. Relate and assimilate into your own life the concepts in Chapter 2. You can change your world. And Chapter 7. Learn to see. 7. Select an environment that will develop you best toward your objectives. 8. Choose the self-motivators for self-suggestion that you believe will help you. Memorize them. Make them a part of yourself so that in times of need they will flash from your subconscious mind to your conscious mind as auto-suggestion. Not all the problems of one's personal life, however, are of so deep and penetrating a nature. Many times, all that it takes to meet an immediate problem is quick thinking, adaptability, and taking a second look at the situation which is causing the problem. It often takes only one idea, followed by action, to turn failure into success. It takes only one idea, followed by action, to succeed when others fail. In 1939, on Chicago's North Michigan Avenue, in an area now known as the Magnificent Mile, office space was going begging. Building after building had empty floors. One that was half-rented was considered lucky. It was a bad year for business, and NMA hung over Chicago real estate like a cloud. You heard such comments as, No sense in advertising, there just isn't the money around. Or, What can you do? You can't fight the times. Then into this gloomy picture came a building manager with PMA. He had an idea, and he got into action. This man was hired by Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company to run a large building on North Michigan Avenue, which they had acquired in a mortgage foreclosure. When he took the job, the building was only 10% occupied. Within one year, it was 100% rented, with a long waiting list. What was the secret? The new manager accepted the problem of no demand for offices as a challenge rather than a misfortune. Here is what he did as he explained in an interview. I knew precisely what I wanted. I wanted to have the premises 100% occupied with choice, substantial tenants. I knew that under the prevailing conditions, it was likely that the offices would not be rented for possibly several years. I therefore concluded that we had everything to gain and nothing to lose by doing the following. 1. I would seek out desirable prospective tenants of my choice. 2. I would stimulate the imagination of each prospect. I would offer him the most beautiful offices in the city of Chicago. 3. I would offer him these superior offices at a rental no higher than the one he was now paying. 4. Furthermore, I would assume responsibility for his present lease, provided he paid us the same monthly rental under a one-year lease. 5. In addition to all this, I would offer redecoration without cost to the tenant. I would employ creative architects and interior decorators and remodel the offices of my building to suit the personal taste of each new tenant. I reasoned, 1. If an office were not rented during the next few years, 
we would receive no income from that office. So we had nothing to lose by going into such arrangements as are above described. We might come out at the end of the year with no income, but we would be no worse off than we would have been if we had not acted, and we would be better off because we would have satisfied tenants who would in future years supply dependable rentals. 2. Furthermore, it is an established custom to rent offices on a one-year basis only. In most cases, there would be only a few months left to run on the old lease of my new tenant. Promising to assume these rentals was therefore not too great a risk. 3. If a tenant should vacate at the end of his year, it would be comparatively easy to re-rent in a well-filled building. The redecoration of his office would not be money lost, as it would have increased the equity value of the entire building. The result was marvelous. Each newly redecorated office seemed to be more beautiful than the one that had preceded it. The tenants were so enthused that many expended additional sums. In one instance, a tenant spent an additional $22,000 in remodeling. So at the end of a year, the building which had started off only 10% rented was 100% rented. None of the tenants wanted to leave after his lease expired. They were happy with their new ultra-modern offices. And we gained their permanent goodwill by not raising the rents at the expiration of their first one year's lease. We would like you to think back over this story. Here was a man faced with a most serious problem. He had a giant office building on his hands that had nine empty offices in it for every one that was occupied. And yet within a year, his building was 100% rented. Now right next door, up and down the magnificent mile, there were dozens of office buildings standing idle and practically empty. The difference, of course, was the mental attitude which each individual building manager brought to the problem. One man said, I have a problem, that's awful. The other said, I have a problem, that's good. A man who seizes upon his problems as opportunities in disguise and scrutinizes them for the good element that is going to be there is the man who understands the very core of PMA. The man who develops an idea that can work and follows it with action will turn failure into success. Time after time, the pattern repeats itself. Problems and difficulties turn out to be the best things that could have happened to us, provided we translate them into advantages. As you recognize, the problem which the building manager faced occurred during the Depression. Things were still plenty tough in 1939 when he solved this problem but they had been much worse. Now the economic problems of the nation and of the world arose as the result of the depression. Depressions are caused by cycles in the economic life of a nation or nations, but it is not necessary to sit idly by. There is no need to be beaten and tossed to and fro by the cycles of life. You can meet the problem of cycles and conquer it intelligently. In so doing, you can often acquire a fortune. Make a fortune or achieve your aims by understanding cycles and trends. Many years ago, Paul Raymond, Vice President in Charge of Loans for the American National Bank and Trust Company of Chicago, rendered a service to his bank's customers. He sent them Dewey and Dakin's book, Cycles. Subsequently, many of these clients made fortunes. They learned and understood the theory of business cycles and trends. Some of them will be among those who won't lose the fortunes they acquired regardless of economic trends and changes. Edward R. Dewey, who has been the director for the Foundation for the Study of Cycles for many years, points out that every living organism, be it an individual, business, or nation, grows to maturity, levels off, and dies. What is equally important, he indicates a solution whereby, regardless of the trend or cycle, you as an individual can do something about it. You can meet the challenge of change successfully. You can change the trend as far as you and your interests are concerned, regardless of the general trend, with new life, new blood, new ideas, new activity. He anticipated a downward cycle and prepared to go upward. Before newspapers publicized the recession that began in the latter part of 1957, one of the bank's clients got into action. His organization went after business aggressively with a positive mental attitude. 
In 1958, his company developed a premium increase of over 30% compared to the previous year, which had shown a 25% increase. The entire industry, however, had a downward trend. Sometimes the cycle that presents a problem is not a cycle that affects an industry or an entire nation. It may be a cycle within an individual business only. This problem, too, can be anticipated and met. Witness the continual growth of many American corporations, in spite of the fact that in the normal course of events they would have grown to maturity, leveled off, and died. E.I. DuPont de Namur and Company Incorporated is an outstanding example. They met the challenge with new life, new blood, new ideas, new activity. It is unnecessary to point out that E.I. DuPont de Namur and Company Incorporated has continued to grow. But what is the cause of its success? Why has it not followed the natural cycle of growing to maturity, leveling off, and dying? DuPont has met the challenge of change with new life, new blood, new ideas, new activity. Its executives have met this problem with PMA and the determination to overcome it. They have continued to engage in research and are constantly making new discoveries, developing new products, and perfecting their previous products. They inject new blood into their management and study and improve their sales methods. Learn from their success. The owner of a small business, or you as an individual, can study and experiment. You can relate and assimilate the principles used by such a large corporation. You, too, can continue to grow with booster shots of new ideas, new life, new blood, new activity. You can change a downward trend into an upward one. You can be different. When others float downstream, you can move upstream. So many of the stories you have heard and will hear in this book indicate that if you have a problem, that's good. It's good if you learn to see how to turn adversity into seeds of equivalent or greater benefit. You may still not see the principle. However, the next chapter, entitled Learn to See, can help you. Pilot Number 6. Thoughts to Steer By 1. So you've got a problem. That's good. Why? Because every time you meet a problem and tackle and conquer it with PMA, you become a better, bigger, and more successful person. 2. Everyone has problems. Those with PMA turn their adversities into seeds of equivalent or greater benefits. 3. Your success or failure in meeting the problems presented by the challenges of change will be determined by your mental attitude. 4. You can direct your thoughts, control your emotions, and ordain your destiny by recognizing, relating, assimilating, and applying the principles that are applicable to you to be found in this book. 5. God is always a good God. 6. When you have a problem, A. Ask for divine guidance. B. Think. C. State the problem, and D. Analyze it. E. Adopt the PMA attitude, that's good. F. Then change the adversity into seeds of greater benefit. 7. Charlie Ward is an outstanding example of a man who successfully met the challenges of change. Prepare to meet the challenges of change by developing PMA. 8. Sex is the greatest challenge of change. Transmute the emotion of sex into virtue. 9. The seven virtues are prudence, fortitude, temperance, justice, faith, hope, and charity. Success through a positive mental attitude indicates how you can relate and assimilate these qualities into your own life. 10. One good idea followed by action can change failure into success. You've got a problem? That's good. For it's the seeds of greater benefits for those who have PMA. Chapter 7. Learn to See When he was born, George W. Campbell was blind. Bilateral congenital cataracts, the doctor called it. George's father looked at the doctor not wanting to believe. 
isn't there anything you can do? Wouldn't an operation help? No, said the doctor. As of now, we know of no way to treat this condition. George Campbell couldn't see, but the love and faith of his parents made his life rich. As a very young boy, he did not know that he was missing anything. And then, when George was six years old, something happened which he wasn't able to understand. One afternoon, he was playing with another youngster. The other boy, forgetting that George was blind, tossed a ball to him. Look out! It'll hit you! The ball did hit George, and nothing in his life was quite the same after that. George was not hurt, but he was greatly puzzled. Later he asked his mother, How could Bill know what's going to happen to me before I know it? His mother sighed, for now the moment she dreaded had arrived. Now it was necessary for her to tell her son for the first time, You are blind. And here is how she did it. Sit down, George, she said softly as she reached over and took one of his hands. I may not be able to describe it to you, and you may not be able to understand, but let me try to explain it this way. And sympathetically she took one of his little hands in hers and started counting the fingers. One, two, three, four, five. These fingers are similar to what is known as the five senses. She touched each finger between her thumb and index finger in sequence as she continued the explanation. This little finger for hearing. This little finger for touch. This little finger for smell. This one for taste. And then she hesitated before continuing. This little finger for sight. And each of the five senses, like each of the five fingers, sends messages to your brain. Then she closed the little finger which she had named sight and tied it so that it would stay next to the palm of George's hand. George, you are different from other boys, she explained, because you have the use of only four senses. Like four fingers, one hearing, two touch, three smell, and four taste. But you don't have the use of your sense of sight. Now I want to show you something. Stand up, she said gently. George stood up. His mother picked up his ball. Now hold out your hand as if you were going to catch this, she said. George held out his hands, and in a moment he felt the hard ball hit his fingers. He closed them tightly around it and caught it. Fine, fine, said his mother. I never want you to forget what you have just done. You can catch a ball with four fingers instead of five, George. You can also catch and hold a full and happy life with four senses instead of five if you get in there and keep trying. Now George's mother had used a metaphor, and such a simple figure of speech is one of the quickest and most effective methods of communicating ideas between persons. George never forgot the symbol of four fingers instead of five. It meant to him the symbol of hope. And whenever he became discouraged because of his handicap, he used the symbol as a self-motivator. It became a form of self-suggestion to him, for he would repeat four fingers instead of five frequently. At times of need, it would flash from his subconscious to his conscious mind. And he found that his mother was right. He was able to catch a full life and hold it with the use of the four senses which he did have. But George Campbell's story doesn't end here. In the middle of his junior year at high school, the boy became ill and it was necessary for him to go to the hospital. While George was convalescing, his father brought him information from which he learned that science had developed a cure for congenital cataracts. Of course, there was a chance of failure, but the chances for success far outweighed those for failure. George wanted so much to see that he was willing to risk failure in order to see. During the next six months, four delicate surgical operations were performed, two on each eye. For days, George lay in the darkened hospital room with bandages over his eyes. And finally the day came for the bandages to be removed. Slowly, carefully, the doctor unwound the gauze from around George's head and over his eyes. There was only a blur of light. George Campbell was still technically blind. For one awful moment he lay thinking. And then he heard the doctor moving beside his bed. Something was being placed over his eyes. Now can you see, came the doctor's question. George raised his head slightly from the pillow. The blur of light became color, the color of form, a figure. 
George, a voice said. He recognized the voice. It was his mother's voice. For the first time in his eighteen years of life, George Campbell was seeing his mother. There were the tired eyes, the wrinkled sixty-two-year-old face, and the knotted and gnarled hands. But to George, she was most beautiful. To him, she was an angel. The years of toil and patience, the years of teaching and planning, the years of being his seeing eyes, the love and affection, that was what George saw. To this day he treasures his first visual picture, the sight of his mother. And as you will see, he learned an appreciation for his sense of sight from this first experience. None of us can understand, he says, the miracle of sight, unless we have had to do without it. Seeing is a learned process. But George also learned something that is very helpful to anyone interested in the study of PMA. He will never forget the day he saw his mother standing before him in the hospital room, and did not know who she was or even what she was until he heard her speak. What we see, George points out, is always an interpretation of the mind. We have to train the mind to interpret what we see. This observation is backed up by science. Most of the process of seeing is not done by the eyes at all, says Dr. Samuel Renshaw in describing the mental process of seeing. The eyes act as hands which reach out there and grab meaningless things and bring them into the brain. The brain then turns the things over to the memory. It is not until the brain interprets in terms of comparative action that we really see anything. Some of us go through life seeing very little of the power and the glory around us. We do not properly filter the information that our eyes give us through the mental processes of the brain. As a result, we often behold things without really seeing them at all. We receive physical impressions without grasping their meaning to us. We do not, in other words, put PMA to work on the impressions that are sent to our brain. Is it time to have your mental vision checked? Not your physical vision. That is a matter for the medical specialists. But mental vision, like physical vision, can become distorted. When it does, you can grope in a haze of false concepts, bumping and hurting yourself and others unnecessarily. The most common physical weaknesses of the eye are two opposite extremes, nearsightedness and farsightedness. These are the major distortions of mental vision, too. The person who is mentally nearsighted is apt to overlook objects and possibilities that are distant. He pays attention only to the problems immediately at hand and is blind to the opportunities that could be his by thinking and planning in terms of the future. You are nearsighted if you do not make plans, form objectives, and lay the foundation for the future. On the other hand, the mentally far-sighted person is apt to overlook possibilities that are right before him. He does not see the opportunities at hand. He sees only a dream world of the future, unrelated to the present. He wants to start at the top rather than move up step by step, and he does not recognize that the only job where you can start at the top is the job of digging a hole. They looked and recognized what they saw. So in the process of learning to see, you will want to develop both your nearsight and your farsight. The advantages to the man who knows how to see what is directly in front of him are enormous. For years, the people in the little town of Darby, Montana, used to look up at what they called Crystal Mountain. The mountain was given this name because erosion had exposed a ledge of a lightly sparkling crystal that looked something like rock salt. A pack trail was built directly across the outcropping as early as 1937. But it wasn't until the year 1951, 14 years later, that anyone bothered to stoop down, pick up a piece of the sparkling material, and really look at it. It was in this year, 1951, that two Darby men, Mr. A. E. Cumley and Mr. L. I. Thompson, saw a mineral collection displayed in the town. Thompson and Cumley became very excited. There in the mineral display were specimens of beryl, which, according to the attached card, was used in atomic energy research. Immediately, Thompson and Cumley staked claims on Crystal Mountain. Thompson sent a specimen of the ore to the Bureau of Mines office in Spokane, 
together with a request to send an examiner to see a very large deposit of the mineral. Later that year, the Bureau of Mines sent a bulldozer up the mountain and scraped off enough of the outcropping to determine that here indeed was one of the world's greatest deposits of extremely valuable beryllium. Today, heavy earth-moving trucks struggle up the mountain and work their way back down again, weighted down with the extremely heavy ore, while at the bottom, virtually waiting with dollar bills in their hands, are representatives of the United States Steel Company and the United States government, each anxious to buy the highly valued ore. All because one day two young men not only observed with their eyes, but took the trouble to see with their minds. Today these men are well on their way to being multimillionaires. A mentally far-sighted person could not have done what Thompson and Cumley did if his mental vision were distorted. For he is the man who can see only far-off values while the advantages that lie at his feet go unclaimed. Are there fortunes right at your doorstep? Look about you. As you go about your daily chores, are there small areas of irritation? Perhaps you can think of a way to overcome them. A way that will be helpful not only to yourself, but to others. Many a man has made a fortune by meeting such homely needs. This was so of the man who invented the bobby pin, and the one who devised the paper clip. It was so of the man who invented the zipper and the metal pants fastener. Look about you. Learn to see. You may find acres of diamonds in your own backyard. But mental nearsightedness can be just as much of a problem as mental farsightedness. The man with this problem sees only what is under his nose, while more distant possibilities go unclaimed. He is the man who does not understand the power of a plan. He does not understand the value of thinking time. He is so busy with the problems that immediately confront him that he does not free his mind to range into the distance, reaching for new opportunities, seeking trends, getting the big picture. Being able to see into the future is one of the most spectacular accomplishments of the human brain. Down in the heart of the Citrus Belt in Florida, there is a little town called Winter Haven. The surrounding country is farmland. Certainly it would be considered by most people as an area entirely unsuited for a large tourist attraction. It is isolated. It has no beach, no mountains, only mile after mile of gently rolling hills with little lakes and cypress swamps down in the valleys. But to this region came a man who saw these cypress swamps with an eye that others had not used. His name was Richard Pope. Dick Pope bought one of these old cypress swamps, put a fence around it, and has turned down offers of at least a million dollars for the world-famous Cypress Gardens. Of course, it really wasn't as simple as that. All along the line, Dick Pope had to see opportunities in his situation. For instance, there was the question of advertising. Pope knew that the only way he would be able to draw the public into such an isolated place was through a barrage of advertising. But ads cost money. So what Dick Pope did was quite simple he went into the popular photography business. He set up a photo supply house at Cypress Gardens, sold his visitors film, and then taught them how to take spectacular shots of the garden. He hired skilled water skiers. He put them through intricate performances while over a loudspeaker he announced to the public exactly what camera settings they should use in order to catch the action. And then, of course, when these travelers went back home, the very best trip pictures were always of Cypress Gardens. They gave Dick Pope the very best kind of advertising there is, word-of-mouth recommendations, with pictures. This is the kind of creative scene that we all need to develop. We need to learn how to look at our world with fresh eyes, seeing the opportunities that lie all about us, but simultaneously looking into the future for the chances that are there. Seeing is a learned skill, but like any skill, it must be exercised. See another person's abilities, capacities, and viewpoint. We may think we recognize our own talents, yet in this respect we may be blind. Let's illustrate with an example of a teacher who needed to have her mental vision checked. She was both nearsighted and farsighted. 
for she could not see either the present or the future potential abilities and capacities of her students, or their points of view. Now everyone, the great and the near great, had to have a starting point. They weren't born brilliant and successful. As a matter of fact, some of our greatest men were regarded as quite stupid at times during their lives. It was not until they grasped a positive mental attitude and learned to comprehend their capabilities and envision definite goals that they started their climbs to success. But there was one young man in particular whom his teachers thought a stupid, muddle-headed blockhead. The youngster sat and drew pictures on his slate. He looked about and listened to everybody else. He asked impossible questions, but refused to reveal what he knew, even under the threat of punishment. The children called him dunce, and he generally stood at the foot of his class. And this boy was Thomas Alva Edison. You will be inspired when you hear the life story of Thomas A. Edison. He attended primary school for a total period of less than three months. The teacher and his schoolmates told him that he was stupid. Yet he became an educated man after an incident in his life prompted him to turn his talisman from NMA to PMA. He developed into a gifted person. He became a great inventor. What was that incident? What happened to Edison that changed his whole attitude? He told his mother about hearing the teacher tell the inspector at school that he was addled, and it wouldn't be worthwhile to keep him in school any longer. His mother marched off to school with him and told all within range of her voice that her son, Thomas Alva Edison, had more brains than the teacher or the inspector. Edison called his mother the most enthusiastic champion a boy ever had, and from that day forward he was a changed boy. He said, she cast over me an influence which lasted all my life. The good effects of her early training I can never lose. My mother was always kind, always sympathetic, and she never misunderstood or misjudged me. His mother's belief in him caused him to view himself in an entirely different light. It caused him to turn his talisman to PMA and take a positive mental attitude regarding studying and learning. This attitude taught Edison to view things with deeper mental insight that enabled him to comprehend and develop inventions which benefited mankind. Perhaps the teacher didn't see because the teacher wasn't genuinely interested in helping the boy. His mother was. You have a tendency to see what you want to see. To hear does not necessarily imply attention or application. To listen always does. Throughout success through a positive mental attitude, we urge you to listen to the message. This means to see how you can relate and assimilate the principle into your own life. Perhaps you'd like to see how you can relate the principle of the following experience into your own life. Dr. Roy Plunkett, a DuPont chemist, made an experiment. He failed. When he opened the test tube after the experiment, he observed that it apparently contained nothing. He was curious. He asked himself why. He didn't throw the tube away as others might have done under similar circumstances. Instead, he weighed the tube, and to his surprise, it weighed more than a tube of like make and design. So again, Dr. Plunkett asked himself why. In searching for the answer to his questions, he discovered that marvelous transparent plastic tetrafluoroethylene, commonly known as Teflon. During the Korean War, the United States government contracted for DuPont's entire output. When there is something you don't understand, ask yourself, why? Look at it more closely. You may make a great discovery. Ask yourself questions. Asking yourself or others questions about things that puzzle you may reward you richly. This very procedure led to one of the world's greatest scientific discoveries. A young Englishman, while vacationing on his grandmother's farm, was relaxing. He was lying on his back under an apple tree and engaging in thinking time. An apple fell to the ground. This young man was a student of higher mathematics. Why does the apple fall to the ground, he asked himself. Does the earth attract the apple? Does the apple attract the earth? Does each attract the other? What is the universal principle involved? 
Isaac Newton used his power to think, and he made a discovery. To see mentally is to think. He found the answers he was looking for. The earth and the apple attracted each other, and the law of attraction of mass to mass applies to the entire universe. Newton discovered the law of gravitation because he was observant and sought the answers to what he observed. Another man, because he exercised his powers of observation and acted upon what he perceived, found happiness and great wealth. Newton asked himself questions. The other man sought expert advice. He became wealthy because he accepted advice. In Toba, Japan, in the year 1869, when he was just 11 years old, Kokichi Mikimoto continued his father's business as the village noodle maker. His father had developed an illness that prevented him from working. The youngster supported his six brothers, three sisters, and his parents. In addition to making the noodles daily, young Mikimoto had to sell them. He proved to be a good salesman. Mikimoto had previously been tutored by a samurai who taught, Exemplification of true faith consists of acts of kindness and love for one's fellow men, not mere formal prayers uttered by rote. And with this basic PMA philosophy of positive action, Mikimoto became a doer. He developed the habit of converting ideas into reality. At the age of twenty, he fell in love with the daughter of a samurai. The young man knew that his future father-in-law would not bless his daughter's marriage with a noodle-maker. Therefore, he was motivated to harmonize with this known power. He changed his occupation and became a pearl merchant. Like many persons who achieve success in any part of the world, Mikimoto kept searching for specific knowledge that would help him in his new activity. He, like the great industrialists of our day, sought help from a university. Professor Yoshikichi Mitsukuri told Mikimoto of a theory of one of the laws of nature that had never been proved. The professor said, A pearl is formed in an oyster when a foreign object, like a grain of sand, is stuck in the oyster. If the foreign object does not kill the oyster, nature covers the object with the same secretion that forms the mother of pearl in the lining of the oyster shell. Mikimoto was thrilled. He could hardly wait to get the answer to the question he asked himself. Can I raise pearls by deliberately planting a tiny foreign object in the oyster and letting nature take its course? He converted a theory into a positive action once he learned to see. Mikimoto had been taught to see by that university professor, and then he used the power of his imagination. He engaged in creative thinking. He used deductive reasoning. He decided that if all pearls were formed only when a foreign object entered the oyster, he could develop pearls by using nature's laws. He could plant foreign objects in the oysters and force them to produce pearls. He learned to observe and act, and he became a successful man. Now a study of Mikimoto's life indicates that he employed all the 17 success principles. For knowledge doesn't make you successful but application of the knowledge will. Action Many of the ideas which come to us as we learn to see with fresh eyes will strike others as bold. These ideas can either frighten us or, if we act on them, make our fortunes. Here is another true story of pearls. This time the hero is a young American, Joseph Goldstone. He sold jewelry to Iowa farmers door to door. Then one day in the heart of the Depression, he learned that the Japanese were producing beautiful cultured pearls. Here was quality, and it could be sold at a fraction of the cost of natural pearls. Joe saw a great opportunity. In spite of the fact that it was a depression year, he and his wife Esther converted all their tangible assets into cash and set out for Tokyo. They landed in Japan with less than $1,000, but they had their plan and lots of PMA. They obtained an interview with Mr. K. Kitamura, head of the Japanese Pearl Dealers Association. Joe was aiming high. He told Mr. Kitamura of his plan for merchandising Japanese cultured pearls in the United States, and asked Mr. Kitamura for an additional credit of $100,000 in pearls. This was a fantastic sum, especially in a period of depression. 
After several days, however, Mr. Kitamura agreed. The pearls sold well. The goldstones were well on their way to becoming wealthy. A few years later, they decided they wanted to establish their own pearl farm, which they did with the help of Mr. Kitamura. Once again, they saw opportunity where others had seen nothing. Experience proved that the mortality rate of oysters into which a foreign object had been artificially inserted was over 50%. How can we eliminate this great loss, they asked themselves. After much study, the goldstones began to use on the oysters the methods employed in hospital rooms. The outside shells were scraped and scrubbed to reduce the danger of infection to the oyster. The surgeon used a liquid anesthetic that relaxed the oyster. Then he slipped a tiny clam pellet into each oyster as a nucleus for the pearl that was to be formed. The incision was made with a sterilized scalpel. Then the oyster was put into a cage, and the cage was dropped back into the water. Every four months, cages were raised and the oysters were given a physical checkup. Through these techniques, 90% of the oysters lived and developed pearls, and the goldstones went on to acquire a fabulous fortune. Time and again, we see how men and women have become successful after they learn to apply mental perception. The ability to see is much more than the physical process of taking light rays through the retina of the eye. It is the skill of interpreting what you see and applying that interpretation to your life and the lives of others. Learning to see will bring to you opportunities that you never dreamed existed. However, there is more to success through PMA than learning mental perception. You must also learn to act on what you learn. Action is important because, through action, you get things done. Don't wait any longer. Listen to The Secret of Getting Things Done, the next chapter, and move another rung up the ladder of success through PMA. Pilot number 7. Thoughts to Steer By 1. Learn to see. Seeing is a learned process. Nine-tenths of seeing takes place in the brain. 2. Four fingers instead of five. This was the symbol whereby George Campbell, the blind boy, could catch and hold a full and happy life. How can you use this symbol? 3. Seeing is learned through association. George Campbell's first sight of his mother became meaningful to him only when he recognized her voice. 4. Is it time to have your mental vision checked? When it is distorted, you can grope around in a haze of false concepts, bumping and hurting yourself and others unnecessarily. Does your mental vision become clearer year by year? 5. Take a look, a good look, and recognize what you see there may be acres of diamonds in your own backyard. 6. Don't be nearsighted. Look to the future. Cypress Gardens became a reality because Richard Pope saw it as a definite future objective. 7. See another person's abilities, capacities, and viewpoint. You may be overlooking a genius. The story of Thomas Edison is a good example. 8. Do you see how you can relate and assimilate the principles of success through a positive mental attitude into your own life? 9. Learn from nature. How? Ask yourself some questions, as Isaac Newton did. If you don't know the answers, get expert advice. 10. Convert what you see into reality by action. Mikimoto converted a theory into a fortune in pearls. Goldstone recognized, related, and applied the principles and methods used in hospitals to save human lives as being applicable to saving the lives of oysters in producing cultured pearls. Open your mind and learn to see. Chapter 8. The Secret of Getting Things Done In this chapter, you will find the secret of getting things done you will also receive a self-motivator so powerful that it will subconsciously force you to desirable action, for it is in reality a self-starter. Yet you can use it at will. When you do, you overcome procrastination and inertia.
If you do the things you don't want to do, or if you don't do the things that you do want to do, then this chapter is for you. Those who achieve greatness employ this secret of getting things done. Take, for example, Mary Knoll Father James Keller. Father Keller had been developing an idea for quite some time. He hoped to motivate little people to do big things by encouraging each to reach beyond his or her own little circle to the outside world. The biblical command, Go ye forth into all the world, was to him the symbol of an idea, whereby the mission he had in mind could be fulfilled. When he responded to this command, he employed the secret of getting things done, and when he did, he went into action. This happened in 1945. It was then that he organized the Christophers, an organization most unusual. It has no chapters, no committees, no meetings, no dues. It doesn't even have a membership in the usual sense of the word. It simply consists of people, no one can say how many, dedicated to an ideal. The Christophers operate on the concept that it is better for people to do something and pay nothing than to pay dues and do nothing. What is the ideal to which each is dedicated? Each Christopher is dedicated to carry his religion with him wherever he goes throughout the day, into the dust and heat of the marketplace, into the highways and byways, into the home, and thus he brings the major truths of his faith to others. The thrilling story is told by the Rev. James Keller in You Can Change the World. It came about because he conceived and believed in an ideal but he did little or nothing about it until he responded to the secret of getting things done. You get the feel of this secret from the statement of E. E. Bauermeister, Supervisor of Education and Correctional Counselor at the California Institution for Men, Chino, California, who told the authors, I always tell the men in our self-adjustment class that too often what we read and profess becomes a part of our libraries and our vocabularies instead of becoming a part of our lives. Remember the biblical statement, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now how can you train yourself to get into action immediately when it is desirable? And then we told Mr. Bauermeister how the good things we read and profess can become a part of our lives. We gave him the self-starter for getting things done. How do you make the secret of getting things done a part of your life? By habit. And you develop habit through repetition. Sow an action, and you reap a habit. Sow a habit, and you reap a character. Sow a character, and you reap a destiny, said the great psychologist and philosopher William James. He was saying that you are what your habits make you, and you can choose your habits. You can develop any habit you wish when you use the self-starter. Now what is the secret of getting things done and what is the self-starter that forces you to use this great secret? The secret of getting things done is to act. The self-starter is the self-motivator. Do it now. As long as you live, never say to yourself, do it now, unless you follow through with desirable action. Whenever action is desirable and the symbol do it now flashes from your subconscious mind to your conscious mind, immediately act. Make it a practice to respond to the self-starter do it now in little things. You will quickly develop the habit of a reflex response so powerful that in times of emergency or when opportunity presents itself, you will act. Say you have a phone call that you should make, but you have a tendency to procrastinate, and you have put off making that phone call. When the self-starter, do it now, flashes from your subconscious to your conscious mind, act. Make that phone call immediately. Or suppose, for example, that you set your alarm clock for 6 a.m., yet when the alarm goes off, you feel sleepy, get up, turn off the alarm, and go back to bed you will have a tendency to develop a habit to do the same thing in the future. But if your subconscious mind flashes to the conscious, do it now, then come what may, do it now. Stay up. Why? You want to develop the habit of responding to the self-starter, do it now. 
In chapter 13, you will hear how one of the authors bought a company with $1,600,000 in net liquid assets with the seller's own money. This became a reality because at the proper time, the buyer responded to the self-starter, Do It Now. Now, H.G. Wells learned the secret of getting things done. And H.G. Wells was a prolific writer because he did. He tried never to let a good idea slip away from him. While an idea was fresh, he immediately wrote down the thought that occurred to him. This would sometimes happen in the middle of the night. No matter. Wells would switch on the light, reach for the pencil and paper that were always beside his bed, and scribble away. And then he would drop off to sleep again. Ideas that might have been forgotten were recalled when he refreshed his memory by looking at the flashes of inspiration that had been written down immediately when they occurred. This habit of Wells was as natural and effortless to him as smiling is to you when a happy thought occurs. Many persons have the habit of procrastination. Because of it, they may miss a train, be late for work, or even more important, miss an opportunity that could change the whole course of their lives for the better. History has recorded how battles have been lost because someone put off taking desirable action. New students in our PMA Science of Success course sometimes state that the procrastination habit is the one they would like to eliminate. And then we reveal to them the secret of getting things done. We give them the self-starter. We may motivate them by telling them the true story of what the self-starter meant to a war prisoner in World War II. What the Self-Starter Meant to a War Prisoner Kenneth Irwin Harmon was a civilian employee for the Navy at Manila when the Japanese landed there. He was captured and held in a hotel for two days before he was sent to a prison camp. On the first day, Kenneth saw that his roommate had a book under his pillow. May I borrow it, he asked. The book was Think and Grow Rich. Kenneth began to read. As he read, he met the most important living person with the invisible talisman imprinted with PMA on one side and NMA on the reverse. Before he started to read it, he had the feeling of despair. He fearfully looked ahead to possible torture, even death in the prison camp. But now, as he read, his attitude became one inspired by hope. He had a craving to own the book. He wanted it with him during the dread days ahead. In discussing Think and Grow Rich with his fellow prisoner, he realized that the book meant a great deal to the owner. Let me copy it, he said. Sure, go ahead, was the response. Kenneth Harmon employed the secret of getting things done. He swung into immediate action. In a fury of activity, he began typing away, word by word, page by page, chapter by chapter. Because he was obsessed with the possibility that it would be taken away at any moment, he was motivated to work night and day. It was a good thing that he did, for within an hour after the last page was completed, his captors led him away to the notorious Santo Tomas prison camp. He had finished in time because he started in time. Kenneth Harmon kept the manuscript with him during the three years and one month he was a prisoner. He read it again and again, and it gave him food for thought. It inspired him to develop courage, make plans for the future, and retain his mental and physical health. Many prisoners at Santo Tomas were permanently injured physically and mentally by malnutrition and fear. Fear of the present and fear of the future. But I was better when I left Santo Tomas than when I was interned. Better prepared for life, more mentally alert, Kenneth Harmon told us. You get the feel of his thinking in his statement, Success must be continually practiced, or it will take wings and fly away. Now is the time to act. For the secret of getting things done can change a person's attitude from negative to positive. A day that might have been ruined can become a pleasant day. The Day That Might Have Been Wasted Jorgen Juldahl, a student at the University of Copenhagen, worked one summer as a tourist guide. Because he cheerfully did much more than he was paid to do, some visitors from Chicago made arrangements for him to tour America. The itinerary included a day of sightseeing in Washington, D.C., while he was en route to Chicago. On arriving in Washington, 
Jorgen checked in at the Willard Hotel, where his bill had been prepaid. He was sitting on top of the world. In his coat pocket was his plane ticket to Chicago. In his hip pocket was his wallet with his passport and money. Then the young man was dealt a shocking blow. While getting ready for bed, he found that his wallet and passport were missing. He ran downstairs to the hotel desk. We'll do everything we can, said the manager. But the next morning, the wallet had still not been located. Jorgen Juuldahl had less than two dollars change in his pockets. Alone in a foreign country, he wondered what he should do. Wire his friends in Chicago and tell them what had happened? Go to the Danish embassy and report the lost passport? Sit at police headquarters until they had some news? Then all of a sudden he said, No, I won't do any of these things. I'll see Washington. I may never be here again. I have one precious day in this great capital. After all, I still have my ticket to get me to Chicago tonight, and there'll be plenty of time then to solve the problem of the money in the passport. But if I don't see Washington now, I may never see it. I've walked miles at home. I'll enjoy walking here. Now is the time to be happy. I am the same man that I was yesterday before I lost my wallet. I was happy then. I should be happy now, just to be in America, just to have the privilege of enjoying a holiday in this great city. I won't waste my time in futile unhappiness over my loss. And so he headed off on foot. He saw the White House and the Capitol. He visited the great museums. He climbed to the top of the Washington Monument. He wasn't able to take the tour of Arlington and some other places he'd wanted to see. But what he did see, he saw more thoroughly. He bought peanuts and candy and nibbled on them to keep from getting too hungry. And when he got back to Denmark, the part of his American trip he remembered best was that day on foot in Washington, a day that might have gotten away from Jorgen Juuldahl if he had not employed the secret of getting things done, for he knew the truth in the statement, Now is the time. He knew that now must be seized before it becomes, Yesterday I could have. Incidentally, to round off his story, five days after that eventful day, Washington police found both wallet and passport and sent them to him. Are you scared of your own best ideas? One of the things that often prevents us from seizing the now is a certain timidity in the face of our own inspirations. We're a little bit afraid of our ideas when they first occur to us. They may seem novel or far-fetched, there's no doubt about it. It takes a certain boldness to step out on an untested idea. Yet it's exactly this kind of boldness that often produces the most spectacular results. The well-known writer, Elsie Lee, tells about Ruth Butler and her sister Eleanor, the daughters of a nationally known New York furrier. My father was a frustrated painter, says Ruth. He had talent, but the need to earn a living left him no time to build a reputation as an artist. So he collected paintings. Later, he started buying paintings for Eleanor and me. Thus the girls developed a knowledge and appreciation of fine art, along with an impeccable sense of taste. As they grew older, friends would consult them on what types of paintings they should buy for their homes. Often, they would loan pieces from their collection for brief periods. One day, Eleanor woke Ruth up at 3 a.m. Don't start arguing, but I have a terrific idea. We're going to form a Mastermind Alliance. Now what in the world is a Mastermind Alliance, Ruth asked. A Mastermind Alliance is coordination of knowledge and effort in a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. And that's just what we're going to do. We're going into the business of renting paintings. And Ruth agreed. It was a terrific idea. They set to work the same day, although friends tried to warn them of dangers. Their valued paintings might be lost or stolen, and there might be lawsuits and insurance problems. But they went right on working, accumulating $300 in capital and talking their father into loaning them the basement of his fur shop rent-free. We hauled 1,800 paintings from our own collections in among the coat forms, Ruth recalls, and ignored Father's sad and disapproving eyes. The first year was grim, a real struggle. 
but the novel idea paid off. Their company, known as the New York Circulating Library of Paintings, became a success, with about 500 paintings constantly on rental to business firms, doctors, and lawyers, and for use in homes. One valued client was an inmate of the Massachusetts Penitentiary for eight years. He wrote humbly that perhaps the library wouldn't rent to him, considering his address. The paintings went to him rent-free, except for transportation costs. In return, Ruth and Eleanor received a letter from prison authorities telling how the paintings were used in an art appreciation course that benefited many hundreds of prisoners. Ruth and Eleanor started their business with an idea, and then they backed their idea up with immediate action. The results were a profit to themselves and increased pleasure and happiness for many others. Are you ready to double your income? W. Clement Stone toured the Asiatic and Pacific areas as one of seven executives serving as representatives of the National Sales Executives International. On a Tuesday, Stone gave a talk on motivation to a group of businessmen at Melbourne, Australia. The following Thursday evening, he received a phone call. It was from Edwin H. East, manager of a firm that sold metal cabinets. Mr. East was excited. Something wonderful has happened. You'll be as enthusiastic as I am when I tell you about it. Tell me about it. What did happen? An amazing thing. You gave your talk on Motivation Tuesday. In your talk, you recommended ten inspirational books. I bought Think and Grow Rich and started to read it that evening. I read for hours. The next morning, I started reading it again. And then I wrote on a piece of paper. My major definite aim is to double last year's sales this year. The amazing thing is, I did it in 48 hours. How did you do it? Mr. Stone asked East. How did you double your income? East responded, In your speech on motivation, you told how Al Allen, one of your Wisconsin salesmen, tried to sell cold canvas in a certain block. You said that Al was lucky because he worked all day and didn't make a sale. That evening, you said, Al Allen developed inspirational dissatisfaction. He determined that the following day he would again call on exactly the same prospects and sell more insurance policies that day than any of the other representatives in his group would sell all week. You told how Al Allen completely canvassed the same city block. He called on the same people and sold 66 new accident contracts. I remembered your statement. It can't be done, some may think, but Al did it. I believed you. I was ready. I remembered the self-starter you gave us. Do it now. I went to my card records and analyzed ten debt accounts. I prepared what might previously have seemed to be an enormous program to present to each. I repeated the self-starter, do it now, several times. And then I called on the ten accounts, with a positive mental attitude, and made eight large sales. It is amazing, truly amazing, what PMA will do for the salesman who use its power. Now Edwin H. East was ready when he heard the talk on motivation. He listened to the message that was applicable to him. He was searching for something, and he found what he was looking for. Our purpose in relating this particular story is that you, too, have heard about Al Allen. But you may not have seen how you could apply the principle to your own experience. Edwin H. East did, and you can, too. You can apply the principles in each of the stories you hear in success through a positive mental attitude. Now, however, we want you to learn the self-starter, Do It Now. Sometimes a decision to act immediately can make your wildest dreams come true. It worked that way for Manly Sweezy. You can mix business and pleasure. Manly loved hunting and fishing. His idea of the good life was to hike 50 miles into the woods with his pole and his rifle and hike back a couple of days later, exhausted, muddy, and very happy. The only trouble with this hobby was that it took too much time out from his work as an insurance salesman. Then one day, as he reluctantly left a favorite bass lake and headed back to his desk, Manley had a wild idea. Suppose somewhere there were people living in a wilderness, people who needed insurance. 
then he could work and be out of doors at the same time. And indeed, Manley discovered there was such a group of people. The men who worked for the Alaska Railroad. They lived in scattered section houses strung out along the 500-mile length of the track. What if he were to sell insurance to these railroad men and to the trappers and gold miners along the route? The same day that idea came to him, Sweezy began making positive plans. He consulted a travel agent and began packing. He didn't pause to let doubts creep in and frighten him into believing that his idea might be scatterbrained, that it might fail. Instead of picking the idea apart for its flaws, he took a boat to Seward, Alaska. He walked the length of the railroad many, many times. Walking Sweezy, as he was called, became a welcome sight to these isolated families, not only because he sold insurance when no one else had thought them worth bothering with, but because he represented the outside world. He went the extra mile, for he taught himself how to cut hair and did it free of charge. He taught himself how to cook, too. Since the single men ate mostly canned foods and bacon, Manley, with his culinary skills, was a welcome guest. And all the while he was doing what came naturally. He was doing what he wanted to do, tramping the hills, hunting, fishing, and, as he puts it, living the life of Sweezy. In the life insurance business, there is a special place of honor reserved for men who sell over a million dollars worth of business in one year. It is called the Million Dollar Roundtable. Now, the remarkable and almost unbelievable part of Manly Sweezy's story is that having acted on his impulse, having taken off for the wilds of Alaska, having walked the railroad where no one else had bothered to go, he did his million dollars of business and more in a single year to take his place at the round table. And none of it would have happened if he had hesitated to employ the secret of getting things done when his wild idea came to him. Memorize the self-starter, Do It Now. Do It Now can affect every phase of your life. It can help you do the things you should do, but don't feel like doing. It can keep you from procrastinating when an unpleasant duty faces you. But it can also help you, as it did Manly Sweezy, to do the things that you want to do. It helps you seize those precious moments which, if lost, may never be retrieved. The endearing word to a friend, for example, the telephone call to an associate, just telling him that you admire him, all in response to the self-starter, do it now.